Hi, this is Nicole Basraba, and this is a rhetorical analysis of social network structures. The information presented on formal networks is based on Charles Kadushin's book, Understanding Social Networks, and Informal Networks on an article by Bankler Sean Hill on peer production. Everyone has an idea of what social networks are, but not everyone knows that they have structures. So what do they look like, and how does it relate to rhetoric? The organization establishes the ethos because it outlines the characteristics of the network. The motivation establishes the pathos because it relates to the participant's emotional investment. And quality establishes the logos, the reason the network exists. Formal networks involve a hierarchy with an appointed rather than elected leaders, participants that are motivated primarily by monetary return, and the production of quality products. Familiar examples are those we see in organizations and companies. Most people have seen some form of an organizational hierarchy diagram like this one, but they often stifle entrepreneurial initiative. Networking is a common buzzword in organizations that recognize the benefit of informal groups, which can increase efficiencies and lead to creativity. They emerge due to shared values and personal relationships based on common interests. This is sometimes referred to as the water cooler effect. Peer production networks are informal and involve open creation and sharing, which occur in online groups. They're decentralized and more democratic since they lack bureaucratic structure, exclusive property rights, and relational contract. A key difference here is that a little goes a long way. Although as peer production projects mature, some form of governance and hierarchical structure becomes more prominent. Larger networks tend to develop leaders supported by popular recognition. Peer production is not driven by traditional economic theories of monetary-based motivation. Instead, people have a diverse range of motivations, like the personal satisfaction of contributing to something, the use value of the end product, increased social status within a community of peers, and even future employment prospects. There is more emphasis on self-fulfillment and contributing to the greater good. These motivations represent a different economic model that relies more on social capital or collective benefits. The output is often of high quality and can stack up to or even surpass that produced by formal networks. And generally, the more people that participate, the higher the quality of the products. Peer production networks generally follow an open commons property regime where the output belongs to the collective. An example of a peer production network is LibraryThing, an online collaboration of 1.7 million users who participate in social tagging of books they've read. This results in new categories coming into fruition and enhances the user's ability to search for books. So in comparing these two, formal networks can stifle innovation since they're closed and information tends to become redundant, but the structure results in guaranteed quality output. Informal networks involve weak ties or structural holes that facilitate new information and ideas, but they lack accountability to generate output. So this comparison raises the question, what defines an optimal network? Collective intelligence is a mode of peer production that combines both formal and informal structures. It involves the centralized control over the goal setting and execution of tasks, a focus on a relatively narrow set of motivations and incentives, and the participants are bound by the obligation of contracts. This term, my master's cohort and I participated in a collective intelligence network. For our Communications 506 course, I would say that it was 40% informal, consisting of blogging and other social networking, and 60% formal, with the wiki entries and the final video assignment. Our course was hierarchical with the professor at the top. As students, we were all connected to the prof and each other. Some of us formed dyads and triads because of our personal interests, and all of us developed informal connections with those external to our class. We had a set of expectations or contracts for output. We needed to post weekly in the eClass wiki in response to a set of questions, blog about topics specifically related to the week's coursework, and network through our chosen social media platforms. The primary motivation for participating in the course was similar to a formal network, because in exchange for our work, we receive grades and ultimately a master's degree, so there is an understood contract between us the students and the professor. Intrinsic motivations included the desire for knowledge, improved social status in our networks, and perhaps future employment prospects. The eClass wiki resulted in academic quality output and also enhanced our understanding of network theory concepts, but because it was a closed group formally responding to the same topic, the information tended to become recycled. 
Developing our own informal networks through social media allowed us to incorporate more perspectives. We could focus on topics that we were personally more motivated to learn about and contribute to. So what does an optimal network structure look like? Is it formal, informal, or a combination of both? There are arguments in favor of each, but there is no one size fits all. The Collective Intelligence Network structure worked well for our Communications 506 class because by engaging in social networking, it allowed us to connect the dots with the theory behind. Now we can think strategically about what type of organization, motivations, and quality drive a network to function and design networks suited to achieve different goals.